Hi YouTube, it's Kathy, and it's finally the day to watch Good Omens, the TV show. I am so excited. This morning I just finished the captions for my May wrap-up, so that now that's up. Yes, I'm still wearing the same shirt as yesterday, because I rolled out of bed, did captions, now I'm making coffee, and now I'm going to watch the show. Before we start, I just want to give a shout out to my mom. Thank you for your Amazon Prime password. First episode down, firstly, really enjoyed uh, what David Tennant looked like, and the fact that they updated his look after the 11 years. I enjoyed that there was queen music. If there hadn't been queen music, I would have just been very upset at the show in general. I enjoyed that it didn't try to cram all of the characters that we're going to meet into this one episode. I assume that we're going to meet the Four Horsemen, possibly in this episode, this one coming up. And yeah, I am enjoying it so far. I also knew nothing about the cast going into this besides David Tennant was Crowley, and I squealed with delight when I saw that Nick Offerman was going to be in this episode, even though he had a very small role and I, assume he might not come back just based on what I know about this. I was very delighted. Right, that's episode two done and I actually, you know, took notes this time so I would have more to talk about instead of just being like, I like it. Firstly, the media communications with Crowley really enjoy. I especially enjoyed now that we got to see it on, done on the television. That was a fun twist, so really enjoyed that. It also seems like they're going to be doing the introductions to the Four Horsemen throughout episodes. So we only got to meet War and I liked that that was expediated because Although I do really like the scene from the book where she is introduced, I think that that was a better introduction, specifically for this medium. Also, I'm gonna have to look it up because I am too lazy to do it right now, but I'm pretty sure that her sword and the flaming sword that Israfel gave away is called a gladius. Gonna double check that though. When the title sequence went by, I got really excited about Miranda Richardson and my roommate got excited about a different name that I didn't catch. Turns out, that it's frickin' Charles McGill from Better Call Saul is playing Shadwell, which is just freaking amazing. So excited about it, especially because yesterday we watched some Better Call Saul, so it was just very good timing for our personal lives. I noticed this last time, and I think I kind of knew this ahead of time, but I really enjoy that Gaiman wrote the screenplays and that he was involved with the production because that just makes perfect sense. Also, you can see a lot of the dialogue is lifted directly from the book, which I appreciate. The Apple prophecy made us laugh so hard. Anathema trying to cross the UK border. If she actually said that, pretty sure she wouldn't have gotten through, but we'll just ignore that. Also, I should have said this during the last update, but I absolutely adore Azarafel's bookshop. I want to live there. And also his cocoa cup. Kind of want one. Also, just a super big fan of the Crowley swagger. It's great. I had to ask during the title sequence, who's Francis McDormand? Because I know I know the name and I know I know the voice. It's the last from Fargo. Excellent. And at this point, I'm just ready to go on to the next episode. Okay, so we finished episode three, which was weirdly paced. I also looked it up. That is a gladius. I was a little bit surprised I knew what that was, but then again, my friend does own an armory, so I'm actually gonna link his armory down below where you could buy your own gladius if you wanted to. I definitely giggled to myself when the Noah's Ark sequence was going on and they were playing Ants Go Marching 2x2. Two two. Although it was fun to see Crowley and Aziraphale throughout the ages, it felt like that took up at least half of the episode before we even got to the title sequence. I didn't check exactly when that happened, but it was very strangely paced. Felt like we took up a lot of the episode just doing these little bits throughout history instead of going through what's actually going to happen in the Armageddon, and given there's only three episodes left and a lot happens in that part of the book, I'm wondering how it's going to play out pacing wise for the next three episodes. I did, however, like seeing Mycroft as a Nazi and David Tennant's consecrated ground dance was wonderful. Also, it makes me wonder if hairstyles are a work of the devil because it seems like Crowley is getting a lot more interesting hairstyles than Aziraphale. All right, I feel like episode four went by really quickly. It did not feel like 50 minutes of television, which is interesting. I love the Atlantis opening. That was wonderful. Also, the Kraken looks very different than I've always pictured a Kraken, but that's not bad. Also, if I'm not mistaken, they only used they pronouns for pollution, which makes me kind of happy. Probably more happy than I should have because they might have done that just by mistake, but I'm gonna count it as a win. I really enjoyed that this Saturday morning fun time that Crowley was just watching in the theater by himself for some reason. When it turned into people talking to him, it was Haster with a frog on his head in cartoon form. Really enjoyed that touch. And the telephone traveling scene is everything I've ever wanted. The only difference between what I pictured it as and it on the screen was it was more pixelated and that's about it. I really enjoyed that scene. Although there's been a little bit of Queen so far, I'm looking forward to there being more Queen because I always pictured like every episode having 
a major Queen song, so I'm looking forward to more of that in the next two episodes. Is it wrong that the saddest part of this show so far is the book fire? One, because all of the books are on fire, but also because Crowley has got this great line of somebody killed my best friend. Also, I was very touched that they use that moment to play Find Me Somebody to Love. They seem to just use all of the best Queen songs in this episode, so they were just saving them up for episode five, apparently. Shadwell is absolute perfection, perfectly cast, and I love that his accent keeps going all over the place because that's exactly how it's written in the book. Also, Miranda Richardson looks amazing in that red hair, and I was so excited when I saw her name pop up, and I'm so excited by her performance in this. Also, that beard. It's also probably a good thing that they shortened down a Seraphel's possessing of people to figure out how to get to Tadfield because that was a long drawn out process in the book. No bar would serve you multiple bottles of Talisker, but I would drink it. Also, I just assume the fact that he's a demon, he can make it so people don't realize he's just screaming to himself in the bar. It's probably also a wise idea that the other four horsemen of the apocalypse were cut, although that was some of the best wordplay in the book. It just does not play out in this format. We finally got another one bites the dust. We got the maggot flood, which I was very excited to see. And of course, if there's a gun on the mantle in act one, you've got to use it by episode five. I laughed out loud at the Air Force Guard reading American Gods by Neil Gaiman. And of course, using We Will Rock You, perfect. And that's that done then. Let's see what my notes say. Uh, the adorable dragon in hell really endured the adorable dragon because who doesn't need a hell dragon? I also appreciated the few times that they gender bent some roles such as Michael and Beelzebub being played by women. That was wonderful. R.I.P. that poor Bentley just... Oh goodness. I love the absolute barf face that David Tennant made when he said, for heaven's sake. Because of the opening credits, I know that Satan was Cumberbatch, but I wouldn't have been able to pick that if I didn't see his name in the opening credits. It didn't really sound like him. And they also changed it so that the sword did all of the killings of the horsemen as opposed to play things, which was an interesting choice. Probably made sense for time's sake. At first I didn't know how to feel about the wrap up with Aziraphale and Crowley until they showed that it was a swap and I really enjoyed that aspect. I kind of figured that's what must have happened uh, based on what was happening in their respective places when they were being tortured or killed or whatever. But I think I ended up appreciating seeing that end to it because this adaptation is mostly about their friendship. So I kind of liked that. In any case, that's me. I spent all day doing that. So I guess I'll put this video together and then, you know, maybe go outside and get some exercise. If you like this style of vlog of me just marathoning my way through a literary adaptation, please let me know down in the comments below. On the way down to the comments, if you hit that subscribe button, that would be very nice. You can like and share this as you see fit, and I will see you very soon. Bye.